Now, I think you know what's coming. We bumped into each other in Hartlepool on the campaign trail yes. on Wednesday morning. Uh, it was the constituency, of course, you represented as a Labour MP for 12 years until <coughs> 2004. And let's just remind the listeners what you told me that morning. If Hartlepool turns blue, I'll go into a meltdown. That's what it says about me. That's all I know. <laughs> Is that a promise? <laughs> That's a promise. Come back on Friday. I'll be in a meltdown. Well, it's Sunday now. Are you still melting so down? I, I pulled myself together now. I mean, I've, you know, I've, I've regrouped. I'm very <laughs> pleased to hear it. You did, however, once enjoy a 17,500 majority in Hartlepool. The Tories now enjoy a 7,000 majority. Mm. So, in your view, what happened? Well, the, there was a turning, a rather sharp turning of the political kaleidoscope. Um, and uh, the Labour Party has to recognise it, interpret it, understand it, get with it, and realize that voters are prepared to move on, vote for different options, and that if Labour doesn't recognize what's happening and change itself, it's going to be in danger of being left behind by those voters. That, that's what's happened. When you say left behind by the, those voters, I mean, that, that, that is a bit of an understatement, isn't it? Uh, we know now that 2019 wasn't the trough. The party is still deepening in its, its, its pit of electoral woes. It's still in reverse. It's still shrinking. Where is the bottom? How bad do you think it could get for the party? Well, I think the whole by-election, and indeed all these elections, took place in very, very special circumstances. I mean, what we're seeing, essentially, is voters uh, in England, Wales and Scotland you know, rewarding those people, those parties and governments that have been responsible for getting us through the pandemic of the last year. Uh, uh, now, I assume that we're not going to live with, you know, perennial pandemics, uh, which are going to impact on our politics so dramatically as, they, as this one has done during the last year. Because what I found during the by-election in Hartlepool, and I think it's true to an extent elsewhere, there was no politics in that by-election, apart from the pandemic. I mean, the, the, the issues, I mean, the, the, uh, uh, the subjects that people were addressing and talking about, it was very, very difficult uh, to land a campaign message in the by-election uh, when all people wanted to focus on was the pandemic and getting, uh, getting, getting through it. Um, that they were frankly grateful uh, for the uh, vaccine, uh, and I think it put voters in a very forgiving mood. Um, uh, and that was the case, not just in England, but in Scotland and Wales as well. You're not really suggesting, though, are you, that if it wasn't for the pandemic, Labour would have held on to Hartlepool? Because the other thing that quite clearly happened... No, is no, hold on, Tom. Hold on, Tom. What did I say right at the beginning? I said the political kaleidoscope mm. is turning and Labour has to recognise that and understand it because there are other sort of structural, deeper underlying things happening, mm. uh, including um, the Labour Party reaping what it has sowed during the last 10 years. The Labour Party has not been a fully functioning viable, recognisably successful political force for over 10 years now. I mean, that was certainly the case in Hartlepool, uh, where the local council leadership were busy mouthing ideological platitudes, indulging themselves in endless internal arguments and infighting, way off the uh, voters' pitch and wavelength. And frankly, they have not been alone during the last decade since Labour... Uh, left, left government. Labour has seriously lost its way during the last 10 years. And the voters notice when you have, you know, when you have Labour councillors or Labour MPs or Labour leaders or candidates who are so out of touch and so out on the limb, who don't speak the language of voters whose support they're looking for, you know, the voters will catch up and deliver their verdict. That's what happened in Hartlepool last week and it happened in other places as well. So I'm just trying to get a feel of, you know, how bad is this? Is this just a, an electoral cycle? You'll be back one day as political parties come back? Or with that total collapse of the working class base that, that used to vote for people like you in Hartlepool in wheelbarrow loads, that's, that has now gone. Is Labour actually in danger of dying altogether as a political party if it doesn't do what you says it must? Yes, the Labour Party has really got to take stock. I mean, you're being very definitive 
uh, Tom, and you're drawing a permanent conclusion. That's what we try to do. A, That's our job. Set of, from a set of circumstances and a narrative which you're sort of buying into here. Now, I am not finding fault, you know, fundamentally with what you're saying, because I do think there are real problems. The truth is that Labour is presently failing to fulfil its core democratic purpose. It's not securing the public support it needs. It's not winning voters' trust and therefore their uh, 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 votes. And it's not therefore achieving power. Now, the tr fact is that we don't exist simply to languish in opposition. We're not a social club or a debating society. We don't exist to talk to ourselves. That is what Keir Starmer recognises and is saying. And in my view, he has a laser-like focus on the change that Labour Party, the Labour Party has to take on. And I think that, if anything, these results are going to act as a very powerful catalyst uh, for change in the Labour Party. I think everyone in the party needs to get on the same page as him uh, and stop holding him back in what he needs to do uh, to put the party back on a winning course. Well, let's talk about what he needs to do. I have to say, it's not entirely clear to me what he is going to do. You say he's got a laser-like focus, but first thing he's done is he sacked Angela Rayner as, as party chair, uh, his duly elected, uh, democratically yeah, I elected... Disagree. I completely disagree, by the way. Uh, with you and Isabel and uh, uh, Jim and Lucy mm -hmm. in, in in how you described this uh, before the news. She's not being used as a scapegoat. He is taking responsibility. He's saying that, amongst other things, we need a different lineup on our front bench and shadow cabinet. He A year ago, he gave responsibility to Angela uh, uh, Rayner and sort of buried her in the machinery of the party when, quite frankly, I think she would be much better uh, uh, used by the party and work much more effectively for the party if she was in a core public-facing policy area uh, where her talents uh, can be much better used. Why shouldn't he do that? That's not about scapegoating. That's not about firing people. That's using people and deploying them in jobs uh, and in areas of policy uh, where they're best suited and where their talent can be best used for the party. And that's what I think he's going to do. OK, we're, we're simply going on what her allies and what perhaps she is saying. She's not ah, very happy about that at, well, at all, Tom, Peter. So you're here's saying... The point. No, oh, no, here's hang the on. point. Oh, here's the point. point. The narrative that was put out was put out by somebody close to her last night in order to create uh, uh, mayhem, taken up, obviously, by Corbyn supporters in the media, and you all swallowed the narrative. I think you should just wait if you don't mind me suggesting, wait for the reshuffle. See where she's been uh, 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 switched. See what's happening to other members of the Shadow Cabinet and see whether in the round this lineup that he's creating isn't going to be much, much better and more effective for the party as a whole uh, in the coming months and years. And I think uh, the time to judge what he's done is then, uh, not late on a Saturday night, when some people are jumping to conclusions, jumping onto uh, Twitter, uh, and frankly, fueling a narrative which is completely misplaced. OK. It's, it's our fault again. We're, we're used to taking the blame. You've, you've said that about us before, Peter. But let, let's go back to the, the, the nuts and bolts of this. How does Keir Starmer fix it? What exactly does he have to do to make Labour electoral again, ele electorally functioning again? Well, I think he's already begun Labour's course correction. I mean, we obviously got onto the wrong path as a party following the defeat in 2010. But I would just say two, two things uh, about the, the last year and, and Keir. One is that at the beginning, I think he underestimated the scale of the challenge he was taking on. And I think he underestimated the scale of the transformation that was needed uh, to meet ex voters' expectations of you know, on, on what they wanted to see the Labour Party do and change uh, 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 and, and, and to take on. And second, I think after the devastating result of the 2019 election, he assumed the party would show some humility and willingness uh, to change. And I'm afraid I think that assumption, or, or, or in the case of uh, some leading members of the party, was misplaced. You mean, just look at the opposition of John MacDonald, Diane Abbott, and other supporters of Jeremy Corbyn, uh, who were responsible uh, for that devastating uh, uh, defeat. 
they're not showing humility and willingness. They're not showing a preparedness to change. You know, they, they are just remaining stuck in a rut, looking backwards and trying to justify and vindicate themselves and the policies uh, on which we lost the last uh, election. Very, very badly indeed. And I think actually it's been a sort of a awakening for Keir. Uh, and I think it will be uh, a catalyst. I think, if anything, it has strengthened him, and I hope and I believe it will embolden him, and that's what the party needs. Well, I think you're being very charitable to him. This isn't his fault. You're basically saying it's everybody else's is fault. But can I just put to you that it might have helped if the Labour Party and so, Keir Starmer so, Tom, had some policies. Tom, Tom, you weren't listening to what I was saying. I was listening very closely, Peter. No, I'm sorry, you weren't. If you say that uh, I am saying it is everyone's fault, what I said to you is that at the beginning he underestimated the scale of the challenge and the scale of the transformation that was needed. Okay. Okay? I get that. I mean, so My question to you, I, though, was I, I, what I'm about making, policies? I'm making, I'm making, quite honestly, a rather more rounded set of observations uh, than, than you're prepared to give me credit for. I'm prepared to give you credit for a lot. I, I did ask you, what about policies? Would it not have helped if Keir Sami went into this local election campaign with some policies, something that he'd say that Labour Party could do to actually interest the voters, that it was devoid of that? Look, the Labour Party has got to demonstrate uh, to the country that it understands voters' aspirations, uh, that it does believe in social justice, uh, that it does know that this has to be paid for, uh, by the way, through a, running a dynamic economy, that we will secure the country and that we will ensure that fair rules are going to be applied, you know, to all across the country, the haves as well as the have-nots. I mean, that is the sort of Labour Party and the areas of policy which he's now got to address. And if it, as I'm hearing, is the case that he's now going to embark on a serious uh, review of policy and a major programme of policy development. Uh, I think that is timely. I think it is uh, uh, desirable. Mm. And I have just described to you the direction in which I think he needs to go. I think that the reshuffle uh, uh, paves the way uh, for that. But I also believe that he needs to look at how the party is organised, uh, how it represents the genuine grassroots of the party and reflects the genuine views and values of Labour voters across the country in all the nations and the regions of the country. The idea that the Labour Party and its policies and its outlook can be driven disproportionately, frankly, by a mixture of um, grassroots members in London and the, and the South East and the sort of hard left factions that are attached to trade unions, that has got to go. We have got to change. Uh, and party reform, therefore, I think is an essential part uh, of what Keir has got to take on next. What about the cultural and the identity war issues that are ongoing at the moment? There's a lot said about those. On Friday, the Labour MP, Khalid Mahmood, uh, who you, indeed you were in the House of Commons with for, for a small period, I'm sure you saw what, what he wrote. He said that... A, well, a London... I saw what he put his name to. Pete, Peter, let me just read it out so the listeners can hear it as well. He said a London-based bourgeoisie with the support of brigades of woke social media warriors has effectively captured the party. Do you agree with that? No, I don't. I mean, I see the point he's making, but he's exaggerating to, to make a point. And I just wonder um, uh, whether he wasn't playing to a particular audience of that, uh, that right-wing think tank he was writing for. So I don't attach huge importance and uh, credence to what uh, Carly is saying. OK, let me put something else to you. Andy Burnham. You were also in yeah. government with him for a little while. In fact, he was a yeah. Labour Party spad and then became yeah. an MP and, of course, a front I've been him for very many years. I like uh, Andy a lot. Well, that's, that's good. Uh, he said the party should get in touch with him if it needs him as leader. And is that the time now? <laughs> no, it's not. He's got his hands full doing a perfectly good job on, for which he'd just been re-elected in Greater Manchester. Uh, and that's where he says his focus is going to be. Uh, and I think that's right. You know, he can't just be re-elected one day and walk off the next. He's got to focus uh, on the job to which he's been elected. And I'm absolutely sure that's what he'll want to do. Let me put something else to you that he said when he, he got himself re-elected yesterday in Greater Manchester, Greater Manchester with, a, with, a, with a big old hefty majority again. He said the party has lost an emotional connection with people. It has deep roots, this loss. It goes back to the early 2000s. Now, Peter, that's when you were in power. That, in fact, is the peak 
of New Labour. That's when he says, Andy Burnham says, who you've just said you're a big fan of, that's when the chasm first began between you, the party, New Labour, Blairism, Peter Mandelism, and your traditional working class base. Then why did those traditional working class uh, voters, the respectable working class, uh, in places like Hartlepool and uh, uh, elsewhere, keep voting for us in such great numbers? Well, they didn't. They voted you in less and lesser numbers until eventually you lost power no, in 2010. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> the people we lost in 2005 uh, uh, were graduates and middle-class, liberal-leaning people uh, in cities. They didn't like the Iraq war. Uh, the, the working-class voters who gave us their support in such huge numbers stuck with us. Go back and look at the sophology. Oh, I, I do, I promise you. You don't think well, the I don't think government... you do. I don't think, don't think you've read it properly enough. The, pe- the, the, the people who went off from the Labour Party uh, um, uh, after the Iraq war uh, were not working class voters. They were not blue collar working class voters. They were in the main middle class professionals. Um, who voted for the Liberal Democrats instead. OK, I, I will take that point, but there is another point, and, and that is the, the Blair government, of which you were a major part, were very comfortable with the South, uh, the City of London, getting, to quote someone who might well be you, getting filthy rich, uh, and you yourself, you literally abandoned Hartlepool for Europe. You, you caused a by-election when you went off to become an EU commissioner, and I'm sure you'll tell me you did brilliant service in Europe for your former constituents in, in Hartlepool from Brussels, but... Do they not look under, at what I, you just what, what, did as a betrayal? I, I don't understand the debating point that you're making, Tom. I'm sorry. Because you, you uh, didn't people, wave my question. People, pe- people, people voted uh, at the subsequent by-election for a Labour MP. If they had been so disgusted with my walking off, I think they might have voted for a different party. All right. You, you say you didn't let them down. I'm going to bring in Isabel there. I just have to put this one thing to you, that famous guacamole story that you, you went into some fish and chip shop uh, and when shown a bowl of mushy peas, you said, yes, please, I'll have some of that guacamole. Yeah, as you well know, completely untrue. You blame Neil Kinnock for that, don't you, for that, for coming up with that? I don't blame him. I credit him with it. <laughs> Why credit? But uh, there is because a serious told, Because he told a funny story. Um, We're all still retelling uh, and, it. But, the, but there's and, a germ and, of and truth. You're, and, you, and, and you're retelling it. No, there isn't a germ of truth, Tom. I mean, look, you, you, I, I, don't quite, I, I don't quite know where you're going with this. Mm. I, I, got, I inherited a majority the Labour majority, when I was first elected in 1992, of something in the region of about 3,000, okay? It went up, jumped up, doubled, doubled again, 97, 2001. Are you saying that that is because people felt that I was, you know, not in tune with them, that I wasn't on the same wavelength with them, that the Labour government was not doing anything they liked, that they didn't want to reward new Labour? I mean, what, what, I don't understand the point you're making. Why did my majorities go up and double during those general elections if people were so dissatisfied with us? Isabel wants to ask you a couple of quick questions. Hello, Lord Mandelson. I'm really interested Hello, in... And welcome to the show. It's very Thank nice you. to be there. Thank you. I'm very interested in how long you think this is going to take. Given you said that Keir Starmer underestimated the scale of the challenge that he was taking on, surely it's... Uh, incredibly optimistic, perhaps even delusional, to think that Labour has a chance at the next general election and that actually he, he may have, you just mentioned Neil Kinnock, he may have more of a Kinnock-esque role in rebuilding the party for, for someone else to take over in a few years' I time. I think it just depends on how hungry uh, the party is uh, for government. Do you think I mean, the reason, it is? The reason, why, the reason why under Blair and Brown we were prepared to... Uh, embraced change in the 1990s, you know, the change that got New Labour elected was because after so many years in opposition, you know, we were fed up with the futility of it. Mm. You know, we'd gone through four successive election defeats before we were elected in 1997. Four successive election defeats. Now, we've just gone through another four since we left government in 2010. And in my view, the party's got to show the same appetite for power and government uh, we had after the last time uh, that we endured those uh, defeats. And what worries me, frankly, is that this appetite, that hunger for government, is absent you know, from, uh, from, from some in the party. We, we've been listening to them uh, uh, in the media in the last 24 hours. And essentially, the people who supported Jeremy uh, Corbyn, who gave us the devastating defeat... Uh, that we suffered in 2019. Now, 
You know, Pete, the party's got to make up its mind. I mean, no one is suggesting, I'm certainly not suggesting that we return to the policy solutions of the 1990s. I mean, mm. that goes against the whole focus on the future and the need to revise policy uh, that new Labour itself embodied. But it does mean, Isabel, that we have to undergo the same scale of transformation and change in the future that we went through uh, then. I mean, if, if anything, our predicament is worse now than it was then. And therefore, the transformation now has to be even greater than it was uh, than we went through in the 1990s. It is not about, let me stress, turning the clock back. You know, that political kaleidoscope that, that has turned you know, we're not simply going to recover by attempting to bring back the past. Uh, I emphatically believe that. Mm. You know, we've got to be embracing new ideas for the 21st century, uh, a new outlook uh, that, that, that people think is relevant and useful to them and it will lead to a genuine, sustained improvement in their lives. And that means the Labour Party is stopping looking inwards, stopping talking to itself, stopping its infighting and stopping overreacting to silly media squalls on Saturday nights over a reshuffle okay. uh, and think much more deeply and profoundly about what the Labour Party uh, is, what it stands for and what it's offering the voters of this country.